Bow High School. It's my privilege this morning to welcome you to another of our Diplomat in the Classroom presentations. I'd like to welcome the students that are here at Bow High School, and I would also like to welcome the students that are joining us via the Granite State Distance Learning Network. We have a number of other schools that are with us today. I believe Merrimack Valley, Woodsville High School, uh, the North Country Education Foundation, Linwood High School, and Londonderry High School are also online. So welcome to all of those schools. These presentations are made possible through the hard work of Bill Kellogg, who is the president of the New Hampshire Council on World Affairs. And so it's my privilege at this time to introduce Bill, who is going to tell you a little bit about the program and introduce our guest speaker this morning. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, welcome to the March Diplomats in the Classroom session. We're at the World Affairs Council are delighted to be able to sponsor these programs, which could not be done without the support of Bow High School and particularly its technology department. We also wish to thank the Sodor Foundation, who has provided the council a grant to support education programs. The concept behind Diplomats in the Classroom is to bring individuals who are experienced in diplomacy and international relations to a forum of this type where, via the Granite State Distance Learning Network, they will be able to speak on issues relating to world affairs to the audience here in Bow, but also to students at sites about the state. The council believes that by using this excellent technology, we can reach many students who we would not be able to reach if we had to go travel about the state. You've heard who the off-site schools are and we'll be hearing from them later on. I understand also that Nashua was planning to tape the program today because their block schedule does not fit in with what we are doing here. And that has been one of the issues with this program that as you all know, every school in the state is independent, there is no state control, and therefore every school system has its own schedule and its own types of classes. The most important aspect of these programs for the, is to allow students to ask questions of the speakers. We hope that the participants will be thinking of questions and be prepared to ask them during the question period. The format for today's forum is as follows. In a moment, I will introduce our speaker. He will make his remarks. When he is finished, it will be question time and we will acknowledge schools in rotation. We'll be ending at approximately 11 o'clock. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who is on a topic which will, who will be speaking on a topic which I don't believe could be more timely. War gaming today as we move from gaming to war. Mr. Robert Guile is a graduate of Dartmouth College. He served on active duty in the U.S. Navy for six years and is a captain in the U.S. Navy Reserve, retired. The global war games have been going on for 23 years and he has participated in 17 of those 23 games. He is the co-author of the global war games the first five years and he is the author of the Global War Games, the second five years, which is about to be published. He served as a member of the State House of Representatives for two terms. He is a stockbroker in Concord and has been so for 34 years. And to bring him directly back to the schools, he served on the school board in Franklin and is presently the debate coach at St. Paul's School. It was a lot of pleasure that I introduced Mr. Robert Guile. Thank you very much, Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And as Bill observed, I think a very timely occasion to perhaps discuss with you a little bit how we go about thinking about war in the academic environment of a war game. 
and in this particular instance, the Global War Game, which started at the Naval War College in 1979. Chester Nimitz, who was the commanding officer of the United States Navy in the Pacific during World War II, recognized the value of wargaming as it had taken place at the War College in terms of the success that the United States forces had in the Pacific during World War II. In a speech at the Naval War College in 1960, he observed, the war with Japan had been reenacted in the game room here by so many people <clears throat> and in so many different ways that nothing happened during the war that was a surprise. Absolutely nothing except the kamikazes toward the end of the war. Many of the concepts that led to our success against Japan in the Pacific War were developed during that interwar period of gaming. The whole idea of mobile logistics, the development of amphibious doctrine that led to the successful capture of many of the islands from Japan. All of these, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, <coughs> all of these were products of that interwar period of wargaming. In 1978, Admiral Hayward was the Chief of Naval Operations. And of course, this was the height of the Cold War, when everyone was concerned about the possibility of war breaking out between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. While the Navy had a pretty good idea how it would fight such a war, Admiral Hayward was uncertain that the Navy actually knew how its efforts and how its actions would fit with the rest of the services and with other nations in joint and combined warfare against the forces of the Warsaw Pact. And so thinking back to the success that we had had in wargaming at the Naval War College in the interwar period, <clears throat> he asked the War College if it would be possible to put together some sort of game that would capture how naval forces might be used to the best advantage in the event of war between the Soviet Union and the United States between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. This was the genesis of the global war game, the first of which was held in 1979. What I want to do today, I think, is to, using the global war game as a vehicle, kind of go through with you some of the things that we seek to accomplish in war gaming, how we go about doing it. Uh, to give you some idea conceptually of the process that's, in, process that's involved, the issues that we seek to discuss, the answers that we hope to gain, and in the final analysis, how all of this fits in with what is probably going to unfold in the Middle East within days, if not hours. With that then, what is the global war game? It was fundamentally a research game with a 10-year focus. That is, we tried to look out 10 years and say, what's the world going to look like 10 years from now? And try to think in terms of what weapons would be available, what systems would be available, both to ourselves and to our potential opponents. The games were not intended to be predictive. There were no winners. There were no losers. The idea was that you used the game as a test bed to surface issues, to examine current combat concepts, and to surface new ideas. We actually used something called a game cycle game, or game study game, excuse me, cycle, in which we did the game, issues were raised, and War College folks studied those issues, determined potential answers to the issues, and incorporated those answers in the next game to see how they, in fact, played. So it was indeed a research game. No forces were moved. All of the actions were simulated. Battle damage assessed by human empires, assisted by numerous and elaborate computer models. That was basically how all of the games were set up what they were intended to do. There were various aspects of some of the games, not all of them, that I think do bear on what we're talking about today. Many of the games were three-sided. <clears throat> and I will slip into jargon probably periodically during these remarks. 
Blue represented the United States, red represented our primary opponent, and the third side was represented by what we called a green team. The green team were normally people who were retired State Department individuals who could faithfully and accurately represent the actions that might be taken by other countries aside from the red and the blue. We would specifically work on constructing a red team to play the red side. Now you could take any number of American naval officers and sit them down and say, okay, you're playing red. Here are the military assets that red has. Go ahead and fight them. However, the way an American officer might fight the red assets might be very, very different from what the actual doc doctrine of the red opposition was. And what we sought to do throughout these games was to be as accurate as we possibly could by taking uh, CIA people, by taking military intelligence people, using them on the red team to fight the red assets as we believed red would in fact fight them, not the way an American officer might fight them given the same sorts of equipment. Again, this was an indication of the reality that we endeavored to put into the game. Some of the games had over 1,000 participants. They were drawn naturally from all the services of the United States military forces. They also involved virtually all of the departments of the United States government and also many of the agencies. I was somewhat surprised one day to discover that we had a representative of the Bureau of Mines playing in the game. Actually, he'd been there for about seven years and I hadn't realized it. <clears throat> we also had foreign participation in these games. The Australians play, <clears throat> the Canadians play, and the United Kingdom plays, both at a military and at a civilian level. Beyond those participants, we also in some games had a number of economists, educators, experts on war mobilization, all to determine what was going to be required in order to accomplish and achieve the national security of the United States. The games were organized in five-year series. That is to look at a particular problem or set of problems over a five-year period of time to give us an opportunity to thoroughly examine the implications and the actions that we might take in confronting the problem saw, or problems raised by the current or what we saw in the future, the 10-year out situation in terms of our national security. <clears throat> What I'm going to do today is to organize my remarks by series, probably spending less time on the older, more historic games and more time on the more recent games that have a greater bearing on where we are today and what may happen <clears throat> in the Middle East. I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical setting in which the games were played, I'm going to talk about the focus that the games had, some of the strategic issues that were raised, and some of the policy conclusions that we came to. The first series, as I say, started in 1979 and ran through 1983. This was our first effort at doing the games. The first game was just a pure, essentially, Navy game in which we were trying to find out if we could even do such a thing. Again, we were trying to address uh, the situation that existed in terms of the Cold War, the confrontation between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, between the United States and the Soviet Union. This had a lot of ramifications to it. One of the major ramifications was nuclear escalation. And one of the objectives of the game was to try and find nuclear thresholds, to look at what might cause nuclear first use, what the other side might do in the event of nuclear first use what escalation looked like. In the process of doing this, some of the games were set in the Middle East, some of them were set in Europe. Some of the strategic insights that came out of this game, or I think one of the principal strategic insights, was that while NATO is a defensive alliance, 
NATO could not fight the war against, uh, could not fight a war against the Warsaw Pact in an entirely defensive manner. One of the major questions at that point in time was whether or not we could operate our carrier task forces in the eastern Mediterranean and in the northern Norwegian Sea. We found out from playing this series of games that if we couldn't do that, we sacrificed a great deal. It could lead to a situation where the Warsaw Pact Soviet Union could take over northern Norway and in that event there was nothing to shield the United Kingdom from air attack. We also discovered in the Mediterranean that if we withdrew our forces from the Eastern Mediterranean, we put Greece, Turkey, even Italy at risk from attack. Indeed, an Italian air base was shelled by a Russian cruiser uh, during, that, uh, during one of those games. So we discovered that we had some really serious strategic problems that we had to confront by determining operationally how we could do things that we hadn't thought about doing. But perhaps the most important thing that came out of that game, or those, that first series of games, was a syllogism. And the syllogism essentially was that NATO did not stand a likely chance of winning a short conventional war in the central region of Europe. That is, the initiator of the war would have the advantage uh, we played it always that, of course, NATO as a defensive alliance would not initiate hostilities, that NATO would initially be driven back before the front line was stabilized. So NATO, we did not feel, could win a short conventional war in Europe. The second leg of that syllogism was that based on our work in this game, we came to the conclusion that nuclear escalation did not work to anyone's advantage going nuclear did not benefit you. Therefore, our conclusion was that NATO should think in terms of protracted conventional war. And that brings us to the second global war game series that lasted from 1984 through 1988. Conventional wisdom at that point in time, again the height of the Cold War, conventional wisdom at that point in time was that if war broke out between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, it would go nuclear in a fortnight. Consequently, no one had looked at what a conventional war in Europe might look like 45, 50, 55 days into the war. No one had any idea. Those of you who are familiar with the First World War may recall that it was anticipated that the war would be over in 30 days, that the economic interaction between the nations in Europe was such that the war couldn't possibly go on for more than a month. It went on, of course, as we know, for a number of years. So that was in part what we were looking at in this game. What happens if the war does go on? We were particularly concerned with logistics. And one of the uh, analogies that was used was the so-called bathtub effect. You start the war with a bath like a bathtub that's full. You have all your equipment, your ammunition, your tanks, your guns, you have everything. Once you pull the plug, the bathtub starts to empty. Can you industrially mobilize fast enough so that by turning on the taps, you maintain an adequate level of water in that bathtub? Can you rearm? Can you make your losses good? swiftly enough so that you maintain your combat ability. What did we find out about the game? In terms of strategic issues, we found out that one of the most important aspects was strategic warning. We believed that our intelligence was good enough so that we would have fairly clear indication if the Warsaw Pact was mobilizing seven to ten days before the war broke out. It was extremely important that NATO take advantage of that warning and mobilize. We also found out that while NATO was a defensive alliance, that there were many offensive options that we could take to exploit the vulnerabilities of RED. That is the Warsaw Pact. 
One of those vulnerabilities was the fact that the rail gauge changes between the Soviet Union and Europe. Consequently, if you are bringing troops from the Soviet Union toward the central region, you had to take them all off the train in Poland and put them on a different train because, again, the rail gauge was different. Now, when you have thousands of troops milling around trying to change trains, this is an obvious situation of vulnerability. And this was the basis of what was called FOFA, or follow-on forces attack. To attack those forces that the Soviet Union was endeavoring to bring toward the front, to disrupt the approach of those forces, to throw the Warsaw Pact off its timeline, and to attrit those forces substantially before they could ever get to the front. <clears throat> From a policy point of view, there were a couple of things that we came up with. One, that war between, the United, between NATO and the Warsaw Pact would be very hard to start. We did not see the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact anxious to initiate a war in Europe. We concluded that if the war ever did start, <clears throat> that it would be an accidental situation. But once it got started, it would be extremely difficult to stop. Extremely difficult to stop. Peace negotiations, which was something that we worked on extensively, led us to believe that it would be very, very difficult, given the cost of the war. Modern conventional war would be very costly in terms of people and equipment that it would be very, very difficult to reach any sort of armistice, ceasefire, or peace agreement. But the other conclusion that we came to was that early use of nuclear weapons was not necessary, that we didn't need to do it. And indeed, as the breakup of the Soviet Union not too long thereafter and the collapse of the Warsaw Pact indicated, the staying power of that nation and its allies was probably much less than what we thought at the time. There's always the tendency to inflate the abilities and the capacities of your opponent. One of the things that you used to hear Kott talked about with some degree of regularity was the 10-foot-tall Russian. And that was something that we endeavored to avoid in our thinking. And so one of the things that we believe was most significant that came out of this game was the concept that you don't need to go nuclear. And I think that the succeeding events showed that going nuclear would have been disastrous. The 1989-1993 Third Global War Game Series was one that started out with much confusion. The Warsaw Pact had collapsed. The Soviet Union still existed at the 1989 game, but there was considerable question as to what was going to happen. Change was certainly in the air. And this series, because of change, focused on future threats to the United States secure, national security writ large. We weren't just looking at military threats in this series. We were looking at the evolving economic structure of the world. We were looking at the educational situation in the United States. We were looking at all of these other things that contribute to national security. In that first global war game series, in, that first, in the first game of this series, we postulated a situation where crises occurred in Panama, in Yugoslavia, and in Korea. Well, two out of three weren't bad, as you will recall. Yugoslavia did, in fact, break up. We have been involved in the wreckage of Yugoslavia and are still involved in it. And, of course, we also found it necessary to institute, <coughs> if you'll excuse me, regime change in Panama. The second game of that series, the 1990 game, was one in which the game sponsor didn't even bother to try to write a scenario. Uh, the Soviet Union had now become the former Soviet Union, the FSU. 
and he felt that to try and write a scenario in advance of the game risked a situation where the game would be overtaken by events. So what he did was split the players into three groups, and he postulated three different worlds. The first world was one that kind of continued along, where cooperation between the various countries was a key factor. The second world was one where nationalism was becoming more apparent, where there was greater competition, greater striving between the countries. The third world was an ideological world in which ideology had taken prominence. The players immediately dubbed these three worlds the good, the bad, and the ugly. The players were asked to list in order of priority what they considered would be the major threats to the national security of the United States in these three different postulated worlds. These threats ran the gamut. There were military threats, economic threats, even natural disasters made it onto the list in some instances. But the threat at the top of everyone's list, interestingly enough, was Iraq. So after that first week, the game proceeded for another two weeks with people making plans as to how to confront what they considered to be the most serious threats. Indeed, after the 1991 Gulf War, the commandant of the, <coughs> excuse me, the president of the War College received a letter from the commandant of the Marine Corps stating that without the experience of the 1990 global war game, the Marine Corps would have found it far more difficult to perform as effectively as they had in the Gulf War in 1991. The last three games of that series concentrated pretty much on change. Looking at various regions of the world, thinking about what challenges there might be to national security in those regions, and in many instances endeavoring to develop regional action plans as to how the United States might confront, deter, or defeat challenges that might arise. The conclusions that we came to from this particular series were that it was going to be a messy world, a very messy world. There had been some order of stability and predictability during the Cold War. Generally, people knew how the two blocks were going to act, they acted as blocks, and things were, as I say, relatively predictable. The thing that we concluded from this series, 1989 through 1993, were that things were going to be anything but predictable. We also felt, coming out of those games, that there would be a declining utility to the use of military force. That, in fact, economic, the economic situation, the globalization of change, <clears throat> economic globalization, multinational corporations, all of the things that we see as characteristics of the global economy today would be things that would tend to vitiate the importance of the military and to inflate the importance of economics. The fourth series that began in 1994 and lasted through 1998 focused on what the national security strategy of the United States was. This was again a period of time where we tended to focus regionally. And the national security strategy at that time was the ability of the military to defunct Con to confront <clears throat> dual major regional contingencies. That is two major theater wars at the same time. And in the normal course of events, those two wars were one in the Middle East and one on the Korean Peninsula. A situation not terribly different than what might potentially confront us today. <clears throat> These games were very much operational games. We had a smaller number of players, and we were concentrating more on war fighting than we were the great broad strategic issues that had been characteristic of the third series. 
There were two things that came out of these games that I think have relevance to what we are dealing with today. One of them was something called WASP, and WASP stood for Wide Area Small Unit Projection. Part of the reason that this came about was because in the 1991 war in the Persian Gulf, we found it essentially impossible to locate the Scud missiles that the Iraqis were firing into Israel and into Saudi Arabia. We couldn't find them. There was also the issue of when you thought you saw something, if you observed it from the air, were you able to tell whether it was a TEL, a transporter or erector launcher for a missile, or was it a school bus? So the idea was that by putting these small parties, inserting these small parties into the enemy territory with communications equipment, they would be able to locate, pinpoint, and direct effective attack fires upon those targets that one wanted to destroy. Uh, I think that we've just seen in the Afghan campaign exactly that concept come to fruition. And it would not surprise me at all if we saw a similar situation when hostilities commence in Iraq. Something else that started in this game, in the 1996 game and lasted for four years, was something called the South Asia Proliferation Project. <clears throat> and this was essentially nuclear weapons in India and Pakistan. We played this in, as kind of a side game over a four-year period of time, and we played it up to and including a limited nuclear exchange. We found in simulating this limited nuclear exchange that we created, and I em emphasize limited in this regard, that the casualties that occurred were so great that they would have overwhelmed the health resources of the entire world. Whether or not this was made plain to the Indian and Pakistani governments when nuclear war seemed to threaten in the last year or so, I don't know. But our conclusion from this game was that it was very definitely something that would be horrendous, even with a limited exchange. <clears throat> Some of the strategic issues that we endeavored to grope with in this game were essentially those of coalition building. Our ability to fight two major regional contingencies was questionable without considerable help from allies. And in the process of coalition building, you had to also consider interoperability. The United States, as I'm sure you're all aware, spends far more on military equipment, on military technology, than does the next 20, 25 countries in the world combined. And so as a consequence of rapidly evolving technological improvement in the United States forces, how are we to ensure that allied ships, planes, tanks could operate with United States forces? A question that we worked on a great deal back then and a question that we still work on today. The other issue that I think comes from those games that is of most significant importance weapons of mass destruction, and terrorism. There is an off-quoted statement by an Indian general which was made following the 1991 Gulf War. And the Indian general was asked what he thought the principal lesson of the Gulf War was. And he responded, get a nuke. So proliferation of nuclear weapons we and other weapons of mass destruction was something that came out of <clears throat> this series, this fourth global war game series, and something that we had a great deal of concern with. Among the players in the National Command Authority at this game, most of the players were probably in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, some older. 
And one of the other very sobering conclusions <clears throat> that we came to during that game was that there will be a catastrophic act of terrorism in the United States in our lifetime. That, I think, has certainly gained greater prominence now than it did at that point in time. The fifth series of games started in 1999 and ran three years. We did not hold a game last year. It was the intent that there would be a game this year. Uh, however, it does not look as though there will be a game this year, and I suspect that the global series, as I have known it, uh, is dead for a while. But those three games were very important, and I think they bring us to where we are today in terms of what may happen in the Middle East. The focus of these games was on something called the Revolution in Military Affairs, or RMA. Probably one of the best examples of a revolution in military affairs was the World War II Blitzkrieg that the German Army, the Wehrmacht, put together. There was nothing new about airplanes. There was nothing new about tanks. There was nothing new about mechanized infantry. But the way the German army put these things together was in a totally new form of highly mobile warfare that caught everybody off guard and was enormously successful in Poland and in France. That, plus the importance of technology, the emerging technologies, were where the focus of these three games really lay. The principal issue was, how do we take advantage of this new technology to improve our efficiency in terms of war fighting? The concept that evolved was something called network-centric warfare. Network-centric warfare was based on a concept called dominant battlefield awareness. That is, if with your satellites, with your aircraft, with your unmanned predators, with all of these various sensors that you have available to you, based on your superior technology, you know more about what is going on on the battlefield than does your opponent. Indeed, it perhaps stretches things a bit, but one of the often heard comments was, that you had a situation where the private first class in his foxhole and his laptop would have access to as much information as the commander of the Joint Task Force, either aboard his ship or back in his headquarters ashore. So the dominant battlefield awareness made possible by sensors, by linked sensors, would be enabled by a flatter chain of command. You're all familiar with the old stovepipe of command where everything had to go up to the general and then come back down the stovepipe. The idea was that if you flattened that stovepipe of command, if you had more options, more opportunity, more ability for the person in the field to take the initiative, then you would have a far more efficient fighting force. Network-centric warfare, based on dominant battlefield awareness, made possible by linked sensors, and enabled by a flatter command structure. What this added up to was essentially a change in warfare, a shift from attrition-based warfare to effects-based warfare. When you think of attrition-based warfare, I tend to think of Ulysses S. Grant and his Overland Campaign of 1864 against Robert E. Lee. Starting in the wilderness, moving on to Spotsylvania Courthouse, the Rappahannock, Cold Harbor, and eventually the Siege of Pittsburgh, uh, of uh, yeah, Petersburg. The whole concept of slugging it out. I can afford more losses than he can. I'm going to hang right with him so that he can't possibly take the initiative. 
I'm going to deny him the initiative. I'm going to pin him down. I'm going to wear him out. This was attrition-based warfare. Effects-based warfare, on the other hand, depends on getting inside the enemy's decision-making process. Whereas Grant would move his army from wilderness to Spotsylvania Courthouse, what we seek to do with effects-based warfare is to perhaps take five or six actions before the enemy has had time or opportunity to even respond to the first one. You may have read or heard some comment that has been made about the coming war with Iraq as being one based on shocking the opposition. That's what we mean when we talk about effects-based warfare. And that is essentially what we spent a lot of time over the last three years of Global working on. This whole idea of moving from slugging it out to an effects-based warfare that affects the judgment, affects the ability, affects the responsiveness of your opponent, and leaves them in a situation where hopefully they will feel that the situation is beyond their control and that they have no choice but to surrender. And that, as I say, is pretty much where we are today. I've tried to give you, in this period of time, some idea about wargaming, what wargaming is and what it isn't, how we've done it in the past, and how it has contributed to our plans, where we are now, what we intend to do, and how we plan to go about doing it. And uh, as I say, I have used as an example of strategic gaming, the Global War Game series, which the London Times of the 13th of February 2003 referred to as a series long seen as the apogee of military war gaming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. We are now going to have questions, and uh, I'm going to call on Bo second. So if there's anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question, will you come up to the mic and just wait here a moment? And we're going to go first to Merrimack Valley High School because they will have a class that has to leave in a few minutes. So if Merrimack Valley High School is on the line and they have a question, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, wait, wait. I think, I think it was. We're, you're, you were here a moment. There you are. Question from there? Don't be can back. you hear us? Yes, we can. Really hear you. Okay. Um, you had mentioned WASP, the Wide Area Small Patrol, as an effective strategy to avoid uh, hitting unintended targets. And I was curious about just how effective that was in Afghanistan, because we hear from the anti-war advocates that a minimum of 3,000 innocent civilians were killed in that conflict. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that, if you have any solid figures for us um, on how effective that was. I, I, don't, maybe expect in Iraq. I, I don't have any solid figures in that regard. I, th I think the observation that I would make is that I believe a lot of the civilian casualties that occurred uh, took place after the initial thrust that was uh, uh, utilized in the, in the WASP aspect of things. Um, I think that the, uh, the major use of that came very early on in the campaign when the effort was made to break the Taliban's position in the northern part of Afghanistan. That was before we really we had any large forces on the ground where we were pretty much depending on the um, opposition forces of the Northern Alliance. Um, I think that uh, after, after that took place, I think that a lot of what has occurred has occurred not in the sense of the wide area, small unit projection aspect of things, but in the kind of day-to-day -day conduct of the war uh, you'll recall that there have been a lot of situations over there where apparently there has been the endeavor on parts of some uh, factions to get even with other factions. And I think that a lot of the civilian casualties that have occurred 
have occurred on that basis and outside the area of the uh, aspect of things that we're talking about. Uh, but, you know, in, uh, in any situation, any military situation, um, certainly mistakes are going to be made, and the best that you can do in a military sense is endeavor to keep the collateral damage, if you will, and I despise that term, uh, to as low a level as possible. We have a question from Bo. Um, do you believe that the war game simulator can be used to uh, help find out, or has, has it helped find out what could happen if um, North Korea has possession of nuclear weapons or gains possession of nuclear weapons? Um, I think that one of the things that you're looking at um, is not so much that aspect of things, uh, but more perhaps toward what the United States response is. Um, we have, of course, gamed situations on the Korean Peninsula. We've gamed a lot of them. And one of the things that comes out of that gaming is the fact that Seoul, the capital of South Korea, is under the gun, literally, as far as North Korea is concerned. The North Koreans <clears throat> can bombard Seoul with artillery anytime they want to. Uh, further, when we talk about weapons of mass destruction, Chemical weapons were used so often by our opponents in the global war game that we often discussed whether or not it was really worth considering chem as a weapon of mass destruction anymore. That we almost saw it as a conventional weapon because it was used so often. <clears throat> now when you put these two things together, the fact that Seoul, South Korea is in easy artillery range of North Korea, and that we would have no particular reason to believe that North Korea would not use chemical weapons, then Seoul is essentially hostage to anything that we may do or may think we're going to do with regard to taking out the North Korean nuclear capability. And that, I believe, is one of the reasons why you have the administration taking a dramatically different approach to the Iraqi situation <coughs> than they are to the North Korean situation. In a word, it's called deterrence. We are deterred from attacking the North Korean nuclear facilities because we know what North Korea could do to South Korea. So it's, it's, it's in that sense, I think, more than uh, uh, specifically getting involved in a nuclear war fighting situation that I'd answer your question. We're going to go to Londonderry next. I understand they'll be leaving also in a few moments. Londonderry. Did you practice? <laughs> did you practice urban warfare during the global war games, and how could it affect our actions in Baghdad? Uh, urban warfare is generally a situation that you sort of play notionally and global. We, we try to stay, you know, when you, when you get into urban warfare, you really get down in the weeds, as it were, into, uh, into smaller unit actions than we normally tried to play in global. Uh, I will tell you that there is an enormous amount of effort put on urban warfare. The Marines have work, been working on this assiduously for probably at least 10 years. Uh, it's, it's recognized as a problem. Uh, it's recognized as something that we don't want to get into if we can avoid it, uh, but we, we do work on it, we do practice it, but not in the global sense. Does anybody at Londonderry have a, a follow-up question they'd like to come up with now? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll be back to you, I hope, before you have to leave. Linwood. Uh, go to Linwood next. Hi. 
Uh, the students in my classroom had recently read the March 17th Newsweek edition about how Iraq is going to fight. And there was reference to war games and CENTCOM. Could you tell us a little bit about CENTCOM? Who are they um, and the war games that they actually did in preparation for the attack on Iraq? Uh, <clears throat> CENTCOM is one of the so-called um, uh, joint and unified commands. Uh, that is, CENTCOM is an organization that has all of the war fighting capacity that it needs to wage a theater war. Uh, that is, they have naval assets, marine assets, army assets, air force assets, and the unified commander who, uh, or, uh, who has command over all of those forces. I can't tell you anything that they may have done by way of gaming. Uh, I suspect that uh, when, when you do those kinds of games, uh, you work at relatively lower unit levels. That is, you're, you're concerned what's going on at the, um, at the battalion level, at the division level. Uh, global generally didn't get down that far. Again, we were trying to raise major strategic issues uh, rather than determine how we would fight a specific tactical battle. Um, but I, I, I really have no knowledge of what CENTCOM may have done, except that, as I say, I suspected it was much more fine-grained than what we do in global. Is Woodsville online? Lovely. Yeah, we're here. Okay. Do you have a question for uh, Mr. Guile? Uh, yes. If this is all, it's just a game. Why don't they have teenagers who would understand exactly how to use all the new high-tech equipment r help run it? <clears throat> the, um, I, think, I think what you're touching on here to some extent is the, um, one of the discussions that has been going on recently with regard to the uh, draft uh, versus the professional military aspect of things. Um, I think that um, certainly some of the experiences that uh, you have now with the technology would enable uh, you uh, and teenagers generally to be pretty well prepared to deal with a lot of the things that we currently work with in terms of equipment. I think that uh, one of the concerns that the military has as far as the draft is concerned is precisely that sort of thing, that they believe that they need people who are fully prepared and mentally able to work with the higher technology stuff and that by utilizing the draft they may end up in a situation where they lose some of the professionalism that they currently believe they have. Woodsville, do you want to follow up on that question in any way? I'd, I'd like, like to, to go. No. All right. I'd, I'd like, like to go, go back, back to uh, Londonderry if they're, they're still on before they uh, leave. Do you have a question? Anybody else there at Londonderry have a comment or a question? Actually, you caught us on a. You caught us on a period change, so we're all okay. done, we're all set. <laughs> all right. I uh, knew you were leaving, and I was hoping you might still be there, but uh, next time we'll try to get you started soon. Um, let's go back to Merrimack Valley High School, and they have a, another question. What is the concept behind the e-bomb? Okay. Sorry, we didn't uh, hear you on that one. Could you? Oh, what is the concept behind the e-bomb? Behind the? The e-bomb. Uh, e-bomb. Uh, you had the. Um, <clears throat> let me, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, whole, the whole aspect uh, of um, IW, um, information warfare 
is, uh, is something that has been kicked around off and on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of starting out with a, a, a larger frame of reference here. Um, this, is, this is somewhat typical of a lot of things that happen in the military. <clears throat> You'll have a concept that will come in like information warfare and it will be the platinum bullet and then you'll play the concept again the next year and it's no longer the platinum bullet, it's the gold bullet. And the next year it's the silver bullet. And the next year it's a common old lead bullet. Uh, a lot of systems come in that people have enormous hopes for. Um, indeed, with regard to information warfare, Admiral Ellis, uh, who was referring to the Kosovo situation, the attack on uh, Serbia made the observation that information warfare might be the ideal thing to have utilized. However, uh, A, nobody was quite sure what the effects would be, and B, most of the information regarding it was too highly classified for many of the people to understand what was going on. Um, what you're getting into here is a whole area that involves impacting the opponent's ability to communicate and to operate. Um, you're, you're dealing with uh, electromagnetic uh, or the utilization of a weapon uh, to create an electromagnetic pulse which essentially fries all of your computers, all of your electronics, um, all that sort of thing. Renders you essentially technologically back in the Stone Age. But there are a number of other, this is only one side of the information warfare thing. There are numerous other things that you can do also. One of them is that you can get inside the SCADA systems that operate the railroad trains so that the railroad trains keep going and it would go in places that you don't want them to go. Might well run into each other. Uh, there are, that's just one other aspect of information warfare. Uh, there are a number of aspects to it. Uh, as I say, we started out thinking it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, uh, but we've uh, kind of lowered our expectations. Hi. Um, you, you talked about how at one point the, the war games were sort of focusing or shifting towards a more economic and uh, mm -hmm. sort of diplomatic way of resolving conflicts. Um, after September 11th, I guess um, it's pretty apparent that we're much more willing to use military now. What, how, is there any sort of way that the, the global war games are trying to shift back to a, a, a peaceful way of resolving it, it, conflicts like that? or? Um, is it, you know, very militaristic now? <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, again, to, to, to start with a, with a somewhat broader pattern and perhaps work back to where you're coming from. Um, broadly speaking and terribly oversimplifying, there are kind of two broad patterns. Actually, there are a lot more patterns, but two generally broad patterns of thinking about international relations. One is called realism. And um, one of the, uh, the major tenets of realism is that it's a jungle out there. There's no overall government that control what can control what nations do. Nations do what they want to do. Hobbes in his book, The Leviathan, Machiavelli, uh, Thucydides, uh, these people would all be considered from the realist school. Um, John Mearsheimer has recently written a book in the realist vein in which he says that states naturally try to increase their power. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is so-called liberalism. Um, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, the uh, Schumpeter, the economist, would all be members of that camp who would contend that no, Actually, there's great opportunity for cooperation between states, that it doesn't have to be a jungle. I think what you're seeing in the conduct of the current administration, particularly since September 11th, is a swing from that sense of state cooperation toward one of unilateral operations. Um, I, it's, it's, you know, as I say, I think global is, is no more. I think we've played our last global war game for some number of years. 
Um, whether, but we, we did in fact, and it, you know, it's I think a function of world affairs, a function of where we are in the world, a function of how badly we feel threatened. While, while we did a lot in terms of multilateral cooperation, alliances and that sort of thing during the Cold War, I believe that the United States still felt more from a realist, realist position that it is a jungle out there. You have to rely on yourself. You have to depend on your own resources. With the decline of the Warsaw Pact, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, I think at that point in time we saw things in a different light, that we saw things more in the liberalist perspective of cooperation as being possible, being important, and being a course that we wanted to pursue. And that's essentially what we did in Global. Now, as you say, since September 11th, I believe we've gone back the other way again. Whether... So uh, do, you, do you see any trends for the future? Or do you, I mean, just out of curiosity? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think, I, think that, I think that whenever you take a position such as the United States has taken, you naturally tend to have other countries that are going to take the position, if you're not going to cooperate with us, we're not going to cooperate with you. And I think there are many areas in the world in which we do require cooperation. I think environment, I think fighting terrorism, um, economics, our endeavor to uh, obtain freer trade. Um, I think that there are any number of areas in which we do require cooperation. Thank you. You're welcome. Down to uh, Linwood again. Have we? Uh, yeah. All right, you're on. Um, how much does one of these simulation games cost? And if so, who pays for it? <clears throat> um, I really don't know what the cost of these were. Uh, it, it kind of depended on the game. As I say, when we, when we had 1,000 people playing, it was... Uh, it was a pretty good sized game. Uh, the game was pretty much paid for um, out of the War College budget. Uh, you, you had, of course, a number of um, military people who were playing who were uh, sent by their own commands. And of course, in that situation, that was uh, no greater cost than would be entailed anyway. In terms of civilian, excuse me, in terms of the Civilian representation, um, a lot of the people who played, uh, played as representatives of the agency or department of the federal government for which they worked. Um, so it's, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to put a handle on the game and uh, a game cost. And it, it, it tended to vary depending on where the emphasis of the game was. If, if for example, you wanted to have uh, a number of experts uh, come in to work on a particular area or a particular topic where their expertise was necessary, but where they were not being sponsored by their own company, uh, their own organization, department, or what have you, uh, then that tended to get somewhat expensive. Woodsville? Is Wood Woodsville, Woodsville still, still on? Look up We're the booth. Like up the booth. No. Back to Merrimack Valley High School then. Hello. Hello. Is this Woodsville? This is Merrimack Valley. All right, Merrimack Valley. Fire away if you have a question. Um, I think we had one last question here. Do you have a question? Um, we were curious about the situation in Rwanda in 1994 and if the genocide that occurred in Rwanda altered the way the U.S. prepares for these situations in our war games, and if so, if that played out at all in, in Kosovo in 1999. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I have... Uh, a, a, a specific answer for that. The, 
the F four, the major, the major game that we played in Yugoslavia uh, was, as I said, the 1989 game. And the, the focus of that game was more one in which we had envisioned the breakup of Yugoslavia occurring before the breakup of the Soviet Union. And what we were trying to focus on there was a Soviet Union that might see a breakup of Yugoslavia as one that had portents for its own future. That is, that the Soviet Union would endeavor to prevent the breakup of Yugoslavia so that its own people would not see a Yugoslavian breakup example as something that they would try to follow in breaking up the Soviet Union. So we were, we were trying to do kind of an interplay around that particular issue. Uh, the Rwanda situation, I don't recall as one that ever arose uh, as far as global was concerned. We have another question from Bo. Oh, hello. Um, I was wondering if on the war games that were held before the first Iraqi conflict, if there was any ever, ever any consideration uh, that the United States might not have all the allies that they normally would in NATO if people would go against us. And if there was that consideration, uh, what kind of ideas, what did they think would happen as a result? Um, during the, um, when, I, when I spoke about the, the earlier games, I talked about the fact that we had a red team, a blue team, and a green team. Uh, the green team, interestingly enough, exercised a great deal of independence. And uh, both the United States and the Soviet Union discovered that uh, their allies indeed might have considerably different ideas than they did as to what they ought to do and how they ought to go about doing it. So we, we, did, in, we did incorporate that aspect of things into the first 10 games, the first two Global War Games series. Um, the other games, yeah, to, to some extent we got into that, but again, our, our efforts there were very, very marked in terms of alliance building, uh, both on a military and a political basis. The third Global War Game series and a good chunk of the fourth really worked on those issues because that is where we were at that point in time. We were very, very much multilateral. And we believed that, uh, in fact, we used, to, we used to actually have discussions as to if the United States went to war in a situation similar to that that we're looking at right now. We used to talk about whether or not, even if the United States could carry out the military operation independently, could it, in fact, to carry it out independently politically. So these were issues that were at the forefront of our discussions. We realized the potential uh, for differing points of view with regard to our allies. And the emphasis at that point in time in the games was more on resolving those issues than it was operating independently of them. We probably have time for one more question. and. Uh, if London, Londonderry is left, Linwood. That looks, a yeah. uh, um, <laughs> lot of people left in Linwood, aren't there? Uh, no, we're here. You're, you're there. there. Oh, okay. um, we had another the picture. War games. Speak up, Linwood. <laughs> with the war games, um, is there any way to simulate a terrorist attack from the inside, like on American soil? And if, how, like, would you be able to go about doing that? The, the, war, games, the war games didn't f feature those things as a, um, a, as a primary aspect of the game itself. But uh, we, we, throughout the games, have always played the potential for sabotage, 
um, for terrorism, for acts within the United States. Uh, as I said, we, we had believed uh, a number of years ago that an act of catastrophic terrorism in the United States was likely. Um, we actually had envisioned this occurring in terms of a bioterrorism event. Indeed, when the Atlanta, the year that the Atlanta Olympics were staged, they coincided with the global war game of that year. And we actually ran a side game with the people in Atlanta that involved the dissemination of smallpox in the air handling system of the Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta. So not only did we envision in the games the possibility of a terrorist event, we actually worked with, in that specific example, um, a, the law enforcement and uh, emergency preparedness people in Atlanta on uh, the actual possibility of something similar to that occurring. I think we'll oh, end we on that. We no. have one more. Yes. What, do you have a follow-up there? Um, yes. Uh, what is the entire scenario to the war games? Is it like walking into a building, I mean, sitting down somewhere, or actually going out and role-playing? Um, <clears throat> what, what you would have, and this has changed over the years, what you would have is a number of rooms. Uh, you would have a, uh, going back to the classical uh, World War III setup, uh, you would have a number of rooms, some of which would be occupied by blue players, some occupied by red players, some occupied by green players, and then you would have a game floor where the umpires kind of put all of these decisions together and uh, arrived at uh, their uh, uh, adjudications as to battle damage assessment. Uh, that information would then go back to the respective rooms. Uh, you would have an intelligence fusion cell. The intelligence fusion cell would look at what was going on and determine what units would be able to see what and what, what they would gain as far as intelligence was concerned. If you had an airplane flying over X, what would they see? Uh, what were the weather conditions? Uh, we had our own meteorology department at these games. We had weather forecasts every day. We endeavored to uh, um, simulate public opinion by having GNN, the Global News Network. Uh, the Global News Network came on every morning in a closed circuit format. And the uh, President of the United States could uh, use it for speech making purposes. Uh, the General Secretary of the Communist Party could use it for his purposes as well. Um, to, to, end on, to end on a note here, uh, uh, one of the things that is always criticized about, global, about war games is that there is no blood on the floor. Um, they're simulations, and that to the extent that they are simulations, uh, that they, they really can't build up the atmosphere. Uh, that would actually prevail so that, therefore, the decision-making process uh, is not subject to the same pressures that it would be in real life. I played for a number of years in the game with a congressman from Virginia, retired congressman from Virginia, and uh, got to know him pretty well. He played the President of the United States. And he said to me one morning, Bob, I couldn't sleep last night. And he said, I couldn't sleep because I know that someday a president of the United States in real life might be called upon to make the decisions that I have to make in the game today. And it scares me to death. I think on that note, uh, we may bring this to an end. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you all very much. My pleasure. I, I hope this has been as interesting to all of you as it has been to me. I've been hearing about war gaming for many years, to hear what has actually been going on, how it may have prepared us for some events and perhaps not for others. And I hope that they will begin again and that some of you who have been participating 
will be able to participate in such games in the future. I know there's a lot of possibility within the technological world today to do this type of thing, and some of you may want to design games that you can play with fellow students around the state or around the world to explore options and possibilities for the future and what the world might look like. This time, I want to thank again the participating schools and particularly Bo for its technological help and its support from Mr. Edwards. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Sador Foundation, which makes all of this possible. We we'll hope we'll see you again at a program. We may not have another one this year, but we certainly want to go back to the drawing boards and try to design programs for the future. And with that in mind, I make one plea to the students. If you have any ideas, any comments, any suggestions, would you pass them on to your teachers who can then convey them to the World Affairs Council? We'd like to refine this program, make it more effective, make it more interesting to all of you. And we can only do that if we hear from you. So please let us know. With that, we'll go off the air. And Bob, there is one young lady here who has a question, and maybe she could ask it of you down here in front before you leave. I, I was going to say, if anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask, I can stay around for a while and chat. Be happy okay. to do so. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Thanks. Thank